In gatherings around America, Christian evangelicals meet to worship. Many are known as Christian Zionists, who interpret the Bible in a unique way. Christian Zionism, or as it's also called, dispensationalism, believes that the Jewish people from throughout the world must all return to the Holy Land. And the state of Israel must conquer all of the land between the Nile River in Egypt and the Euphrates River in Iraq. They must blow up the mosques on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And for three and a half years, after they have rebuilt their temple and reestablished the Levitical practices of animal sacrifice, for three and a half years they will worship the Antichrist. Jesus Christ will return and lead an army of hundreds of thousands and kill off all of the Jews with the exception of 144,000 who will promptly convert to Christianity. A second element is the belief in the imminence of tribulation, part of an end time scenario in which the human race itself will be destroyed in a holocaust uh, inevitably involving nuclear war. The third element in Christian Zionism is the notion of the rapture. The idea that before tribulation is in full swing, Jesus will return, not for the final time, but for a second time. He returns three times according to the doctrine of the rapture. And he will lift from the earth all of the born again true Christians, the living and the dead, who are born again will be whisked up to heaven where they can watch the destruction of the earth from bleachers in the sky. Well, there are always elements of this end-time Armageddon idea on the fringes of Christianity. You can look at it. Uh, even in New Testament times, there is an, an, a, is a takeoff from the apocalyptic texts and the theology, which was popular in Jesus' time. But it never was central. And Jesus, we know, downplayed it, as did Paul and others. But it remained an element of people wanting to know how the last days are going to be resolved. Um, often it would pop up at a millennial year. So you can go back in church history. I've done a little bit of this uh, in the year 900, in the year 1000. There was a lot of emphasis on the return of Jesus in the end times. In the year 1800, it was a very popular year because there was a lot going on in the world. Um, the American Revolution, the French Revolution had just taken place. Uh, Europeans were upset 
And uh, so there's a lot of focus on the turn of the century in 1800. And shortly after that, a lot of writing and theology developed <clears throat> around the idea of the end and predictive prophecy. And uh, one fellow who caught it a little bit later is this John Nelson Darby, who broke away from the Anglican church. And he was in a Bible study meeting and a woman was caught up with the spirit and she began to speak about the books of Daniel and Revelation as prophesying the end and claiming, I've had a word from the Lord that we are in the last days and Jesus is about to return. This had a huge impact on a few people who were in that room who saw her as a prophet. And they began to form uh, some prophecy conferences. A former parliamentarian was there and sponsored them at his estate. Darby got involved in this, John Nelson Darby, this breakaway Anglican, and he began to do Bible study and he systematized that movement in a series of writings. And he was very bright, he was a Greek scholar, he knew the New Testament and studied it in Greek, he knew Hebrew. But what he did was he, he actually tried to create a logical connection between what he saw as Jesus taking people literally into the clouds from 1 Thessalonians 4, so he inv invented the doctrine of the rapture. Some claim he got it from others, but what we know, he invented that. In the post-Civil War era, the Second Great Awakening, uh, many evangelicals were converted to this teaching by Darby, who made six missionary journeys and became very popular uh, in those Bible and prophecy conference movements after the Civil War era. John Nelson Darby in, in the 1830s was an Irishman who had an epiphany that he alone could decipher the meaning of the Bible. He was a literalist and he was a cherry picker and he was able to create this hair-raising horror story involving tribulation and the punishment of mankind and Jesus as a warrior as a result of his epiphany. And he believed, as did all of the dispensationalists after him, that he alone understood the Bible and that every other human being and all of the Christians were not only in error in terms of their understanding of the Bible, but they were also under the influence of satanic forces. So what is meant by the term dispensationalism? The essence of dispensationalism, as one might expect coming from uh, gentlemen who hated the rest of the world and were self-appointed uh, guardians of the truth, the basis of dispensationalism is the notion of original sin. And a dispensation is one of a series of seven events with the same pattern, namely that God dictated to the Jewish people a certain course of action knowing that they would violate and fail so that he could punish them. Most of these exist in Genesis. They should be familiar with everyone. Eve eating the forbidden fruit. The Jewish people and mankind being wiped out through Noah's flood. The various exiles of the Jewish people because of their sinfulness. Finally, and most important, was the rejection by the Jews of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. In each case, the Jewish people were given an assignment or a dispensation. They violated it and they were punished. The seventh dispensation and the final one requires the Jews to return to Israel so that they can be exterminated, except for the 144,000 that will immediately convert to Christianity. And then they created this two covenant idea, that there are two covenants in the Bible. The covenant with the Jewish people from Genesis 12 and in other places is eternal. It's never broken. The covenant with the church comes later after the resurrection 
and ends, according to Darby, with the uh, rapture, where the true born-again Christians are removed from history. Later in the century, Edward Irving popularized the notion of the rapture. And finally, a gentleman named Cyrus Ingersoll Schofield codified the dispensationalist ideology into a Bible called the Schofield Bible, in which he was able to use headlines, cross-references, and footnotes to inject his own interpretation of the Bible into a seamless web that is now used by dispensationalists as the, uh, the inspiration for their ideology. And then uh, Schofield created, C.I. Schofield created this outline which was laid over the biblical text with commentary and divided the Bible up. And this became the greatest uh, advocacy piece, the Schofield Bible, which fundamentalists and evangelical Christians read, and that's what I grew up with. So I grew up thinking, well, this is what the Bible teaches. From the 19th century up to the latter half of the 20th century, dispensationalism continued to be a marginal doctrine among Christians. However, the partition of the Holy Land in 1948 and the subsequent establishment of the State of Israel seemed to be a validation of biblical prophecies. Then in 1967, facing the threat of destruction by Egypt, Syria, and other Arab states, Israel launched a preemptive attack which culminated in the Jewish conquest of Jerusalem and the West Bank. And this gave credence to the notion that biblical end times were imminent. It began in 1967 with the successful conquest of the state of Israel at the expense of its Arab neighbors of a territory that actually tripled the uh, the, the size of the state of Israel. And this was a turning point in many ways for the Muslim world, the Christian world, and the state of Israel. It gave the Israeli military the kind of prestige that made it possible for the United States and the leadership at that time to realize that Israel was a good place to invest its military dollars as a gendarme for the Middle East. It also, for the first time, mobilized the, uh, the, the right-wing section of Israel's society to suddenly regard Jerusalem in a totally new light. Up until the 1967 conquest of Jerusalem, it was not regarded by the, uh, any element of Israeli society or any of the streams of Judaism as somehow central to God's plan for the Jews, but that was all changed in 1967. In addition, it had effect on the Muslim world. The crushing defeat of the armies of Egypt, Jordan, and Syria, and to a certain extent Lebanon, was extremely demoralizing, and it gave an impetus to Muslim fundamentalism, because many Muslims said that the reason why the Jews were successful in taking over Jerusalem, including the third most holy uh, site in Islam, was because they were more religious. And so it spurred fundamentalism, Muslim fundamentalism. In addition, it was the major motivation for the development of Christian Zionism which up until this time had been a fringe movement within even evangelical Christianity. And it began with the publication in the late 60s of a book by a man called Hal Lindsey called The Late Great Planet Earth, in which he essentially cribbed the lecture notes of his uh, mentor at the Dallas Theological Seminary and laid out this long dormant end time scenario with the conquest of Israel by the Jews and the ingathering there as the central feature of the beginning of the end of the world. The success of his book and the introduction of uh, television and mass radio and the media that became dominated 
in many areas by Christian broadcasters and the enormous amount of money generated and eventually the alliance with the Zionist lobby in the United States gave the impetus to the enormous expansion of this formerly fringe ideology. On February the 7th of this year, over 400 of America's foremost Christian leaders met at Cornerstone Church in San Antonio and unanimously agreed to come to Washington, D.C. for one reason, and one reason alone, and that was to stand up and speak up for the state of Israel. What an incredible gathering of individuals here. This is fantastic. I can't resist to say it. I will be silent no more. Our times demand it, our history compels it, our future requires it, and most of all, God is watching. 5,000 years from now, we won't remember much, but we will remember this night and we'll still be talking about it. We'll be talking about the night that the wild branches that were grafted into the mercies of God stood up. We today stand for Israel because we stand for democracy. We will defend ourselves. We will defend our values. We will defend our democracies. And we will defend the spirit of God which unites us. Hagee is the self-appointed leader of an organization called Christians United for Israel which is the most prominent Christian Zionist organization in the United States. John Hagee and the Christians United for Israel has an enormous amount of political clout, as we so see. Joseph Lieberman likened John Hagee to Moses. At the recent Christians United for Israel, or Kufi conference in Washington, D.C., a panoply of Republican and Democratic politicians praised the work of Hagee and Kufi, and even George Bush presented his approval through a live telecast. This organization has an enormous amount of power. Christians United for Israel uh, was created, I believe it was in July 2005, with it was launched with their first conference in Washington, D.C. But there's a history to it. It goes back to the moral majority in the, in the late 1970s and several pro-Israel uh, organizations that grew out of that, like Stand for Israel and many others. And uh, Hagee um, had for many years in his uh, San Antonio megachurch, Cornerstone Baptist, held Knights to Honor Israel. He's a dispensationalist. He believes all the centrality of Israel kind of theology. Uh, he has raised millions of dollars, some of which is diverted to illegal Israeli settlements. Uh, so he has, I think, been uh, you know, kind of uh, courted by some of these right-wing pro-Israel Christians and the pro-Israel Jewish lobby, APAC, to be the spokesperson and the founder of this new movement, Christians United for Israel. First, Christian Zionists believe that Christians have a primary obligation above all else to support the policies of the state of Israel, to support its occupation of Palestinian land, to support it as a ethnically pure racist state which uh, discriminates against the large minority of Arab Israeli citizens, much as Mississippi discriminated against black people under Jim Crow. It also supports the expansionist policies of Israel as a military state. And there is virtually nothing that Israel can do that the Christian Zionists are not willing to support. In fact, they are more Zionist than the Zionists. Pat Robertson, 
probably one of the most prominent televangelists and a Christian Zionist, actually suggested the general and the later prime minister, Ariel Sharon, was stricken with a terminal coma because he defied God by evacuating a number of Jewish settlements from Gaza. So the first element in Christian Zionism and what gives it the name Christian Zionism is its unqualified support for Israel. Which they get from the pro-Israel Jewish lobby, APAC. So if they want a war in Iran, then they want, they're going to mobilize Christians. It is time for America to consider a military preemptive strike against Iran to prevent a nuclear holocaust in Israel and a nuclear attack in America. So, and they're also organizing regionally and then they have their national convention. So it's a, it's a growing and a powerful movement. Virtually every major televangelist on Trinity Broadcasting Network or other media is a Christian Zionist and buys into this ideology. It is a billion dollar industry. The total audience, viewer audience, reading audience of media controlled by Christian Zionists is estimated to be larger than the total readership of Time, Newsweek, the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, and the New York Times combined. The greatest potential of pro-Israel voters will be among fundamentalist Christians. And it's an element in uh, America that's growing. And uh, the Israeli lobby sees that, hey, that represents a larger number. And it's also uh, you know, a, a, a natural base of automatic support for the issues we want. Now, ironically, despite the large number of people who believe in the rapture, some 39% of Americans, for instance, believe that when the Bible refers to the end of the earth recur occurring through fire, this means nuclear war, and some uh, 70 million people believe in the rapture, Americans, incidentally, this is almost exclusively an American ideology, 100% made in America. They believe, despite the large number of people who believe this, you will find that very few of the rank and file Christians who believe in elements of dispensationalism have even heard of the term, much less understand the underlying philosophy and the methodology behind it. The, uh, the idea of the rapture, I do not believe it's a biblical doctrine. Um, Hage, er, well, Hagee preaches, but Darby took 1 Thessalonians 4 and made it into a literal historical event. Uh, so where it talks about Jesus coming into the clouds and the believers, I believe that is symbolic language, not an actual historical event. But when you look at where it takes you, it forces Jesus into a double second coming. Jesus has to come in the clouds to remove the church, then Jesus has to come back again that's not biblical. Christian fundamentalists believe that the Bible and its prophecies are in fact a playbook for the present. In other words, the prophets of the Bible, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Isaiah, were not simply social critics at the time warning the, is, the Israelites of their evil ways in order to attempt to correct them as all traditional Bible scholars see it, but that somehow those prophecies fell into a 2,000 year old time warp and were simply waiting for Pat Robertson and John Hagee and Jerry Falwell to come onto the scene and apply those prophecies to current day events and the eventual and imminent end of the world. So they are a force and uh, for me as an evangelical and for many of us uh, they, they do not represent the gospel. It's a distortion and uh, it really undermines I think a just peace in the Holy Land 
and they have no concern, not an ounce of compassion for Palestinian Christians who are really suffering, losing land, and being driven out. Now, wouldn't one expect that the Zionist movement in the United States would be opposed to Christian Zionism, both because of the fate that it dictates for the Jewish people, but also because of its ideology, which traditionally, going back to Darby, has believed and put forward unequivocally that God created Christians and Jews to take different paths through their history. The Jews were to take an earthly path, and the Christians were to take a heavenly path. And Jews were never to be allowed to go to heaven unless they converted to Christianity. Obviously, the Zionist establishment in the United States is perfectly aware of the anti-Semitic content of Christian Zionist ideology. But going back as far as the late 1970s, when the State of Israel reportedly gave Jerry Falwell his personal Lear jet, the Zionist establishment has realized the value of Christian Zionism despite the essential anti-Semitism of its ideology. To Z Jewish Zionists, the Christian Zionists are useful idiots. For the end-timer Christian Zionists, the Jews are sacrificial lambs.